Well, hello, everybody. Woo. <laughs> good evening, good evening, good evening. You guys can get your Bibles out. We'll be in Ephesians chapter 4 tonight. And uh, if you need the outline, you don't know where to get it, go to newbreak.info, and that's where the outline is, and that's where it resides. And we start this new series entitled Burning Platform, and tonight is all about walking worthy. And uh, the reason we entitled this Burning Platform is because we're at a hinge point in, the, in our study and journey through the book of Ephesians. If you're new with us, we've been basically living in, the, in Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus for about six months now at this point. And we're at a hinge point in the whole line of thinking of the Holy Spirit who's inspiring Paul to write. And chapter 4, verse 1, is that hinge point. It's kind of where he gets done with all this great theology, this great uh, thinking through of truths about God and experiencing God and what it means to have the grace of God in our lives. You think backward to our, in the early part of our series where we were in chapter 1 where Paul says that it's in Christ that I find out who I am and what I'm living for. So all of that is in all of chapters one through three. And now at chapter four, there's like a hinge point. Uh, it's kind of been referred to like this. Because of all of these things, these realities, these experiences, these truths, therefore, now we act, now we do, now we move. So it's in the light of kind of the knowing and the being that we now do. And this evening's all about walking worthy, walking in a way that's worthy of the calling, as we'll read from Scripture. And in fact, you have this on the top of your outlines. You guys look at it. It says, if my character doesn't match my calling, I'll what? I'll waste my worth because you are of incredible value to God. You're his kids. How many of you have kids? So you know what that's like, right? You're of incredible value to God, but we'll waste our worth and sabotage our success. Those of you who are uh, on a prayer list, and perhaps in general, you guys are aware that one of our elders, Merrill Roach, who's a really our founding elder, Merrill is, was, a, was an elder when we started New Break, uh, what is it, 1986. So I've been with Merrill a long, long time. We're like best friends. And he... Um, He's, he was on a cruise in Alaska and had a brain aneurysm, has been in intensive care for 18 days. He got out yesterday. Yeah, so it's pretty, pretty miraculous. Uh, you know, had to medevac him, airlift him from wherever he was in Alaska down to Seattle and just all kinds of drama and trauma. My wife, Teresa, flew up there, was with Alan as his wife, and, and uh, so they, uh, Teresa went up there and hung out with them for a few days. And so we've been praying for Merrill. Keep praying for Merrill. Uh, if you could write that down in your notes somewhere, just keep praying for Merrill and Alan, his wife, to, you know, kind of make it through. It's very difficult for us because they're in Seattle, <laughs> you know. So, I mean, we'd have a bazillion people helping, it, but it's very, very challenging. So, just be praying for them. But when I was a young pastor and Merrill was on my elder body, um, <laughs> he laughs over this story. It's just funny. <laughs> um, we were, this was when we were a baby church. We were in La Jolla. That's where we began. And it was after an elders meeting. And uh, he kind of stuck and kind of hung around. <laughs> and uh, he, said, uh, he said, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? I said, sure. And so we were in the hallway, actually, downstairs in our building. And he said, I just need to ask you about something and talk with you about something. And I, I said, oh, well, sure. And he goes, would you, would you uh, mind, like, if in our elders' meetings uh, you would stop cussing? <laughs> and I said, cussing? What do you mean cussing? And he goes, yeah, you know, I mean, it's occasionally, and tonight, in fact, you, you said a cuss word. I said, what was the cuss word? And he, and, uh, he said, well, you said the S-H word. I won't say it out loud in the room. And I said, I did not. And we had this, like, heated discussion in the hallway. And I said, no, I didn't. I never say that word. And he goes, yeah, you do, Mike. You know, every once in a while, you, like, let that thing drop. And I'm like, no way. And he goes, yeah, you do. And we, it was just a, it was, it was like, it was like I was doing something that I really didn't know that I was doing, uh, and that Merrill had the uh, authenticity, I guess you would say, and the, the character to confront me, to care enough to confront me. And uh, I don't know about you, but I really try to work on cussing less. Raise your hand if you work on cussing less in life. We'll get there in chapter four, uh, four, 
Paul says, don't let any, <laughs> I know, don't, let, I know it's just me, right? Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is, anybody know that verse? Helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who will listen. And, and I'm not here to discuss all of the ethical nuances of saying different cuss words and culture and so forth, but, you know, generally, <laughs> we need to watch how we talk and watch how we behave and watch how we walk because this is all about walking worthy. So let's go there. You guys have your Bibles. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to be in uh, just as verses 1 through 3. And this is such a striking set of scriptures, especially in America today. We live in such a uh, relativistic uh, society in terms of philosophy. Like the extant philosophy of our day in America is basically relativism, where there is no right and wrong. We're going to talk more about this next week. You don't want to miss next week. We're going to talk about kind of this whole idea more uh, next week. But, but in our culture, there, there are no mores per se. There, and we're really struggling for this, obviously, as a nation, uh, whether it's ethnic uh, uh, you know, how we get along ethnically and, and the whole refugee situation we have uh, going on, and we are very much involved in ministering to the refugees in East County, obviously. By the way, this past week, I put it on my Instagram, we fed over 200 families, I think it was uh, Thursday night or one of the nights this week, and about 1,200 people, we, you and I, fed them through Kingdom Builders and our generosity. Give it up for yourselves and what God's doing in and through us. And we'll talk about kingdom builders in a little bit because this is kind of like our uh, update on it. But anyway, look at, look at what Paul says. This is really an, a striking section of Scripture. Now, remember, he's, he's moving from kind of straight-up theology to application, all right? So look at verse 1. Paul writing, as a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life, what? Of the calling you have received. Now, he's... Uh, he's not writing to pastors, he's writing to people in the church and the house churches in Ephesus, okay? As a, uh, live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And then he says the how kind of, like he sort of describes for you how you're supposed, how many of you uh, work uh, for a living, you work outside the home, work outside the home, okay. So many, most of you. So he, he describes how you're to be in your workplace, how you're to be on your street, how you're to be in your family. And how you're to be in your ministry teams and life groups and whatever. He says, be, and it's a, it's a high bar. Look at what he says. Look at the language. He says, be what? What's the first word? <laughs> no, the first word is completely. Good luck with that. <laughs> that will, don't lower the bar. Remember chapter 2. Just have grace for yourself. God's giving you grace. He knows you're a project. He knows he's got his hands full with you, but don't lower the bar. He says, be completely, what's the first word? Humble, right? Be completely humble and gentle. Oh, man, does, did he ever have a two-year-old? I, I don't know. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Now, the unity of the Spirit is something that God creates. If you notice, it's our duty, our Christian duty, our Christian challenge to keep it, to keep the unity. The unity is a, production, a product of the Holy Spirit at work in your lives and in us as a church, in your life group, whatever. It's our duty to, to kind of keep it and, and, and hang on to it and handle it and navigate it. So how is it that we do this? How is it that we respond in this way? The first thing you guys have on your outlines is that we have to lean in. We have to lean in to who we are in Christ. You might write this verse down. Again, it's my life verse, Ephesians 1.11, but in the message translation, I love it in the message translation where it says it's in Christ. It's in Christ. Remember, that's the idea that Paul plays with repetitively in the letter to the church at Ephesus. I believe it's 36 times he talks about being in Christ. It's in Christ that I find out who I am and what I'm living for. So you have to lean into who God's made you to be. Now, Paul describes himself in this passage. If you've been with us for a while, you know that this is one of the prison epistles because Paul writes it from prison, uh, this along with Colossians and Philemon and uh, Philippians. But, but notice how he describes himself. He's in a Roman prison, but he says, as a prisoner 
for whom? For the Lord. As a prisoner for the Lord. Notice how he describes his life. He has to lean into who he is in relationship to Christ. He says, I urge you then to live this life worthy of the calling that you've received. And the word worthy, uh, we get the word uh, axis from it. Axios is the Greek word. It's, it's, a, it's a balanced life. A balanced life where, where it's balanced between who God's made you to be and the kind of leaning into that and who God is in your life, and then who we are with each other, and then who we are in the world. I want you to think of a, like a teeter-totter on a, you know, on the little axis thing, you know, like a teeter-totter like that, and then think about it like this. So it's kind of like this perfect balance that Paul's calling us to, but you got to lean into who you are, and you have to learn how you're wired and discover your, new, your unique giftings in life. Because all of you are made unique by the hand of God. It's like a miracle in our lives. We've been given different gifts, Paul writes in Romans. One of the great sections on spiritual gifts. We've been given different gifts according to the what? Grace given to each of us. This is why, uh, you know, you guys, we encourage you, if you're not involved in serving yet, to get involved in our next step class, which is actually next Sunday during the 1045 uh, uh, service. You go to the, we call it Discover Your Pathway. And it's an environment in which you'll kind of begin to journey on who God's wired you to be, which you're all unique from each other. And yet there are, there are ponds of ministry where you can serve together and complement one another. And we call it DYP sometimes, or Discover Your Pathway. And it happens twice a month. Uh, and it's really a, a great environment. Now, I want to read you a story that comes from, uh, from that uh, DYP group. And this is a story about this wonderful couple, uh, Olivia and Tim Raber, okay? So this, listen to this story. This is sort of a fresh, I mean, it just came to me last week. We lived just down the street from Newbreak for a few months and would see all the signs and the advertisements, so we decided to give it a try. Now, so this is a couple who has no uh, relational capital, if I could put it, inside of Newbreak. So they, they just saw the signs, so they don't know anybody. How many of you came to Newbreak that way where you didn't really know anybody? Raise your hands up real high. Everybody look around for just a second. This is super important. Uh, because when you come into Newbreak and you don't have any relationships, it's just very uh, challenging because you, you know, you're, and it's scary, right? Yeah, it's a little scary. So listen, listen to their story. So, uh, so once, once we were on the campus, I think the thing that really stuck with us was how welcoming everybody was. See how important you are? Do you see how important you are? Every time you come to service, every time you go to your life group, every time you serve. We are a military family. How many of you are thankful for that? Yeah, come on. My two grandsons joined the Marines July 30th. They were sworn in. They're coming to, they're at MCRD. I can't get in there to see them, but they're there. Um, we are a military family, and our only family is on the other side of the country, so we were desperate for people to just love on us and show us that we mattered. Do you hear that? Attend after attending for nearly five months, we decided it was time for us to go to the Next Steps class. We took the step to serve on First Impressions team, and we love it. So they're involved in, uh, that's the teal-shirted people when you come. <laughs> They're the greeters, the ushers, the servers, all those people. Um, we love it. We have always been involved in church and getting to serve here and show others the love of Christ and to just be that nice, friendly uh, friend people need who are trying church even for the first time. The real tug at our hearts are other military families who need people just to pour out love and affection onto them as a couple, but also their sweet babies. So you know how I teach you all the time that your story becomes your ministry, right? Your story becomes your ministry. So, so this part of their God story has now equipped them to have this kind of unique capacity of love. That's how you're wired. That's how they're wired. That's a God thing. God does that to you. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, there, were, there were obstacles 
there were no obstacles that would hinder us from serving, but we have, an on, we have ongoing struggles that can make us feel like maybe we shouldn't. We would think, maybe there's someone who would do this better. How many of you have ever thought that, right? Uh, we have been facing financial hardships for a while now, and it feels like each month there's another bill that can't be paid because of an unexpected expense. So surely God couldn't use people who just struggle every week, right? Wrong. We love to see this proven as a lie from the devil each and every time we serve. Isn't that cute? It just reiterates that life and ministry and showing God's love and joy is not situational. It's not even about us. It's about being a light for those who need it, for those coming to church and giving God just one more chance. We want to be someone that God can shine through. And then they write, I would encourage you to get involved as soon as you can. If you need to just heal for a while and just come to church and worship God and be in his presence, then, then do that and join when you feel his tug on your heart. Needing to take time to heal does not make, mean you are less. But I'd also say, don't hesitate. Healing can come from serving. Simply setting up and tearing down or cleaning uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to feel like you're doing anything big for God to heal and use you in mighty ways. Isn't that awesome? It's really cool. Uh, she's actually serving in hospitality tonight, so it's, it's pretty awesome. So you just have to lean into who you are and, and embrace your limitations. You have limitations. All of you have limitations. Now, God's working on those sometimes. He's trying to shift those in us and trying to develop us. I'm not saying that. It's just that you kind of have to embrace your limitations. Paul writes in, in Corinthians on this whole section of gifts and ministry and so forth. He says, but in fact, God has placed all the parts in the body. Now, he's referring to you. You're a part in this passage, okay? Uh, So you are the part. He's placed all the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be, just as he wants you to be. That's how he's placed you in the body. But you have to be careful because I can become a better version of me, but I will never succeed at becoming a better version of you. So you have to lean into who you are. And it's about self-awareness. Honestly, this is a bit about emotional intelligence. Uh, There was a time when our... Uh, boys were hitting middle school, I believe it was. It's a long time ago, but uh, they were hitting middle school, and my wife, Teresa, and I got in a fight, an argument, uh, about how to raise teenagers. How many of you have ever been there? If you haven't, you haven't had them, uh, you'll get there. (laughs) Anyway, Teresa and I were discussing heatedly uh, how to raise particularly the boys, and, and and she was like, she's like, <laughs> oh, I wish she was here to share this story. She was like, she was, uh, you know, we were debating what we were discussing. And she goes, well, I think I just need to, uh, and we're standing at this point. I think I just need to go to therapy. I just need to go to counseling. And I said, honey, sit down. And now how many of you know this is not going to go well? <laughs> I said, honey, sit down. I counsel people all the time. Just sit down. I'll tell you what you need to do and how you need to do it. And like Meryl, like Teresa, Teresa goes, you are the reason I need therapy. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Oh, that was the beginning. That was not, I don't know, that wasn't the beginning of our therapy journey, but whatever. (laughs) Again, it's about self-awareness. And then strengthen your strengths. You guys are amazing, and you, but you have to develop. You have to kind of develop your spiritual muscles and your, your faith muscles. And, and this is what we do in our body all the time, in our church body. You know, we, whether it's ministry, on our ministry teams, in our giving. You know, many of us are learning just how to become a generous person. We're starting to learn how to tithe, give a tenth of our income to the work of our local churches, in our case, and then to kingdom builders, to all that we're doing around the world. We're going to see a video about this in a minute. But it's about strength. Strengthening our strengths is about what your spiritual gifts are and leaning into them and using them in the context of your God story with one another and making a difference in the world. Look at what Paul says in Romans 12. He says, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. Notice that. That's very interesting, isn't it? In accordance with your faith. And faith is like a muscle. You develop, a, you develop your faith, right? Faith is a gift, and then you develop it in your life, your whole life long. If it is serving, then serve. 
serve, if you will, in accordance with your faith. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. Again, in accordance with your, with your faith. If it is giving, then give generously. Some people have a gift of giving. That's like their jam. You know, they, they generally become people of means, and, and it's because they're faithful along the way, and then they do it uh, spectacularly. There was a woman uh, at the OB campus last weekend or the weekend before, and she's a, she tithes, so she gives a tenth of all of her income and, and uh, supports the church. Anyway, so she came to Pastor Carter and she said, hey, Pastor Carter, I just sold a home and I made a profit on it and I'd, I'd like to write a check for it. How do you want me to do it? And Pastor Carter said, well, you can just drop it in the offering. If you want to bring it over to me, that's fine. And she brought him the check for $15,000 made out to Newbreak. And, and, and it's amazing, right? Like that's a God thing, right? So would you do that? Like if you sold a home and profited from it, would you tithe on it? Is it income from the eyes of God or do you treat God like the IRS? <laughs> How does that work in your life? And again, generosity is always a fun thing because it's not something that God wants from you. It's what he wants for you. He wants to develop you. This is like mercy. He's talking about the gift of mercy, but you all are called to be merciful. Like with Teresa. I was called to be merciful. I was being a jerk, right? So, whatever. <laughs> anyway, do it cheerfully. Now, we're going to show you a Kingdom Builder update. This is a video we shot this past week before the outreach of Thursday or Friday, whatever it was. But this is Pastor Eric and kind of giving us an update of our what we're doing thus far with Kingdom Builders. And if you're new to us, Kingdom Builders is what we call all of our offerings above our tithe. And we use those funds to do different facilities, things like, like we're planting a campus in Hillcrest, and uh, we've spent about, I think it's $220,000 this year on that campus. And it'll launch, I think it's like the second week of September or something like that. Uh, and Pastor Isaac is this. So watch this video. Just check this out. Hey, New Break, Pastor Eric here from the East County Campus and Director of the Hope Center. And I just wanted to take a minute and just thank you for believing in the power of life change. You know, it's hard to believe that at the beginning of 2018, we started off with a kitchen and a dream to begin to feed food insecure families and individuals all in East County. And guys, I'm here to tell you right now, you are, have been instrumental in making a miracle become a reality and bringing hope to the world one person at a time, one family at a time. Year to date, in the last eight months, now think about that for a second, we have fed over 17,000 meals. I mean, that's way more than we ever could have imagined. Isn't that amazing? But that's not it. Like there's so much more. We've helped 37 people with job training and, and helping them get a job here in East County. Uh, 42 families, we've helped them with housing assistance and getting them connected with the right programs to get them off the street and back into housing. And then 37 people have made decisions for Christ since 2018 began. In eight short months, God's been able to unleash that sort of miracle. And it only happens because of your generosity. It only happens because of your willingness to serve. You are the people who fuel and fund hope being distributed all throughout East County. And so I just wanted to thank you for that. You know, it wasn't that long ago, about eight years ago, that Newbreak adopted the East County campus and brought her into the family. I can't help but be excited to talk to you about our new campus that's launching in early September. That's our Hillcrest campus. Pastor Isaac and his wife Kelsey are getting ready to launch there. In the first couple of weeks of September, there'll be a vibrant, thriving church community right on the corner of Normal and Harvey Milk in the heart of Hillcrest. Now, one of the things that's happening at Hillcrest that excites me the most is we actually have a Swahili-speaking congregation that meets there every Sunday afternoon. It's mostly made up of refugees from West Africa. Now think about that for a second, that God's begin to open doors, not just around the world for us to serve refugees, but right in our own backyard right in our Hillcrest campus to be serving the Swahili speaking congregation that are you know, coming to this country for the first time and having their lives changed and having a place where they can meet Jesus face to face. It's been exciting to see what we've done in a partnership with the SoCal Network. 
We were committed to helping refugees and planting churches, not only in Greece, but in Lebanon. There's tons of refugees pouring into both of those countries. And for us to be able to bring the gospel and to bring hope, to bring clean water, to bring second chances and new beginnings to these refugee camps, I'm telling you, it is something dynamic and special. And we're seeing people's lives change, not just in Lebanon, but in Greece, here in the United States, in San Diego, not just at our Hillcrest campus, but at the Hope Center and other ministries in San Diego that support refugees through soccer camps and English as a second language and other resources that are welcoming them as they get off the ship. I mean, here they are coming to a new country where they don't speak the language. They step off of the boat, they step off of the plane, and somebody's there to meet them and help them find their way, get connected and get plugged in. We really only have about four months left in 2018. But to accomplish all the things that we know that God's called us to, we need a lot. We need about $500,000 still to finish this year strong. But I believe in you. I believe in your ability to make this happen. Now, whether your gift is big or small, it really matters because collectively we can reach these goals. You know, honestly, I want to talk to some of you very specifically right now. Some of you have the ability to give a year-end gift that would be a life-changing gift for Kingdom Builders and for the people that receive the blessing and the life change that comes from Kingdom Builders Ministries. Some of you have the ability to write checks today that are bigger than the person sitting next to you. But I want to challenge you to be prayerful about what God's calling you to do. And I want you to be thinking about and talking with your family and your spouse about what is your plan to finish strong with Kingdom Builders in 2018. Isn't that awesome? Woo! It's amazing what God does through us uh, people. I, I uh, was in my devotions. One of my devotionals this week was talking about uh, worry. How many of you struggle with worry? It was a really cool devotional. And uh, he was talking about what Jesus' words were in Matthew chapter 6, especially as it relates to finances and, you know, the idea of beginning to try to tithe and then beyond that to give to kingdom builders. And uh, the devotional said three things about it. You might want to write these down. Very cool. Uh, when I worry about, about money, because Jesus is talking specifically about how you worry about money in Matthew chapter 6, uh, Jesus talked a lot about stewardship and the problems of it in our lives. He says uh, it's unreasonable because Matthew 6, 25 uh, says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body, what you'll wear. Is not life more important than what? Food and the body more than clothes. So it's unreasonable. It's unnatural. Jesus talks about how the birds of the field and the flower, uh, birds of the air and the flowers of the field, they don't worry. We're like the only creatures in the world that worry. <laughs> it's, un it's unnatural for us. And then thirdly, it's unnecessary. Uh, Matthew 6.30, you know, it's just unnecessary because God is our heavenly Father and He'll take care of us. He'll watch over us. We'll talk more about that next week. But uh, it's like this verse in Deuteronomy. Uh, here, let me click to it. The purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God first in your lives. This is Deuteronomy 14.23. That's why you have to lean into all of that. And then you have to pay attention. You have to look around. Look around. Look around at your, like in our church, look around in your community, particularly Tierra Santa, and just pay attention. And he says to do it a certain way. Look, look what he says. And here's this challenging section of the scripture. Be completely humble. Now, in, in, um, in the Greek language, there's called the, the law of priority. When there's a word that comes first, you pay attention to it. It's sort of like an organizing idea. So he says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Bearing with one another in love. The word gentle there is a, just a powerful word. It means, again, kind of balanced. Uh, never angry at the wrong times and angry at the right times for the right reasons. It means to be, well, the word was actually used of a war horse in Roman world, in the Greco-Roman world. It was used of a war horse who was reined and whose, the reins were in the hands of a master rider swordsman warrior. We're the war horse. Be completely humble and gentle. And then that word that we all love, we're going to have an opportunity to pray for more patience tonight. Now, you know what happens when you pray for patience right? 
the heat turns up. That word, uh, you could translate it long-suffering, long-suffering. Um, and then it says, bearing with one another. Uh, Veronica was talking earlier about life groups starting. So in your life groups, you get to bear with one another. You get to, you get to love each other. You get to do this work of God. It's, it's an amazing, worthy life. And virtuous character changes the way we view and value one another. It just does. Like, like that's why, that's why s s ma many of you walk in the joy of the Lord. But you have to tell your face. <laughs> like, if I were to ask you, do you have the joy of the Lord in your life? You would say, oh, totally. But you, you shout with your body, you speak with your words. So this is about social intelligence, emotional intelligence. That's really what's, what Paul's talking about. In, again, in the book of Romans, he says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. Now, it doesn't mean to think of yourself lower. It just means to have an accurate view of yourself. Self-awareness. This is super crucial in all leadership uh, paradigms. Don't, uh, so he says, but rather think of yourselves with what? Sober judgment. The sober judgment in accordance, again, with the faith that God has distributed to you. That, and that's how we roll. That's how we operate. And by living this out, life change happens. Like we just had a youth uh, camp, a youth retreat uh, that we, through Kingdom Builders, we subsidize it and help pay for it. And, and at this, thing, at this uh, student uh, camp, we had 87 students go to it. 20 of them began their relationship with Jesus. 20 of them. Are they worth it? Are they worth it? So you, you have to look around at the way God is moving in your life and, and wants to use you. And then listen well is the last one. Listen well, because you are chosen. You and I, we're chosen. But we have to learn to listen. Listen to God. Look at what it says. Make, how, what's it say? Make what? Every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. And what do, who do you have to listen to? You have to listen to your street. You have to listen to the people around you. You have to listen to their needs and assess their needs so that they can, you can bring ministry to them. God's gifted you to do this. In our outreaches from our campus, when we do the love weeks and all that kind of stuff, you have to, you have to listen to the spirit. You have to listen to the needs around you so that you can kind of move into it and kind of lean into it. And this is what God wants to do in all of our lives. But you have to do it in a certain way. You have to... You have to smile. <laughs> you have to be completely, what's that word? Humble <laughs> and gentle. And yeah, the P word. <laughs> patient, patient. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes. <sighs> Father, you use us in so many ways challenging ways, life-thrilling and life-giving ways. And you, you give us so much, Lord. You've entrusted us with so much, not just money and all that, but our lives, our gifts, our talents, our abilities, God, to serve, to serve you, to serve each other, to serve the world around us, to make a difference. Lord, we now have a Swahili congregation. We have a a Swahili-speaking congregation. We have a Korean-speaking congregation. We have a, an Arabic-speaking congregation. We don't know hardly anything about that. So you're going to have to help us. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, how many of you know you need to pray for patience right now? Raise your hands up. You need to pray for humility. You need to pray for faith. You can put them down. Are you here and your life's just not right with God? You've either never begun your relationship with him or, or you have, but it's just not, it's not right. It's not, it's not wholesome. It's not the way God wants you to walk, and you need to pray about that. Raise your hands up. I want to pray with you as well. Awesome, awesome. Several of us. God bless you guys.